Australia, a place of beauty and tranquility. But beneath the calm exterior lie powerful forces ready to unleash destruction without warning. In this episode, you'll see freaks of nature, tragedy in paradise, devastation on a grand scale. It looks as though bombs have hit all along here. It's like a war scene. The despair, the terror. The whole building you could feel dropping. And the triumphs of the human spirit. <laughs> On Savage Australia, Earth. <laughs> Australia is old, very old. It's only been an island continent for around 55 million years. But the rocks and minerals beneath us date back well before that. The world's oldest known material, some pretty everyday looking grains of sand, are found in Western Australia. These are 437 million years old. Australia is usually considered a relatively quiet continent a sleeping giant in a world where the landscapes dramatically change in front of our very eyes. Earthquakes have shattered New Zealand and Italy, tsunamis have inundated Japan and Indonesia, and volcanic eruptions have blasted Iceland and Russia. But beneath the surface of the Australian continent, there's plenty going on. A lot of people don't realise that Australia, the whole continent of Australia, is moving north at seven centimetres a year and crashing into Asia. The stress from these collisions deform the rock. When the stress in the rocks becomes too great, they will break and move permanently. In other words, an earthquake. On average, Geoscience Australia locates more than 600 earthquakes each year. We've come to know uh, where some of the hotspots are, places like the, the Gippsland Basin in, in Victoria, uh, the Flinders Ranges through South Australia, and the Southwest Seismic Zone in uh, Western Australia are our most active areas. We get roughly 10 magnitude 4s, two or three magnitude 5s a year in Australia, and those are the ones that really uh, give everyone a good shake. This is Newcastle, coal capital for 160 years, hub of the Hunter region. A great industrial metropolis, the nation's third busiest port, commercial, administrative, educational and shopping centre for 410,000 ambitious Australians living well. Australia's sixth largest city has long been one of the country's industrial powerhouses. Since the 1970s, Coal has been shipped around the world from the busy natural harbour. The BHP Steelworks was the beating heart of the city during two world wars and for many decades after. The unofficial capital of the New South Wales Hunter region, Newcastle's residents were tough, working class Australians. Between 1842 and 1987, there'd been about 13 small quakes in New South Wales, including the Hunter region, but at worst, they'd caused minor damage and a few scares. In the early 1800s and in 1925, there were uh, three earthquakes, so it does have a little bit of a seismic history. On December 28th, 1989, Newcastle's history would dramatically change course. At 10.28 a.m., Newcastle was hit by a 5.6 magnitude earthquake. The residents were totally unprepared for such a catastrophic event. A local news reporter covering a transport dispute suddenly found himself covering the story of his life. Um, we hope that, uh, that something good comes out of this. Mm. Union management relations, though, how would you describe them? Terrible. Hey, let's go call the two way at work immediately. Here, race back. Get into the car. Don't worry about me, I'll follow you. When the earthquake occurred, people will feel the primary wave arrive, and that's generally just a, a really sharp jolt. 
and then following that are uh, surface waves which are, are much slower and there's a lot of shaking associated with those waves as they pass through. Well this is Beaumont Street, Hamilton just minutes after the blast or the explosion or the earthquake and it looks as though a bomb has hit. Bombs have hit all along here. It's like a war scene. People are standing around just dazed. There has been some loss of life, it appears, and buildings all up and down the street have just collapsed into the roadway. It just came underneath the buildings. Everything just flew off the walls and it just... I don't know. Did your building collapse? No. No, we were really lucky. And I came out here and I noticed all of this. There was no rhyme or reason. Unscathed buildings sat alongside collapsed awnings. Single walls were blown out in some places. Other buildings were totally destroyed. Even here at the northern end of Beaumont Street, the Kent Hotel has been absolutely devastated. And there are people probably caught underneath the rubble here, but rescuers can't get to them because the wall overhead looks so unstable it could come down at any moment. In Australia, we hadn't had a lot of sort of very large damaging earthquakes prior to Newcastle, so uh, not a lot had been done in terms of earthquake resistant building codes. So the impact for that city it was uh, very devastating. People spilled onto the street, some dazed and stunned. Others were doing what they could to rescue or comfort the injured. Power was out, phone lines were down, and information was scarce. Tony Briscoe reporting from Newcastle there, and as we told you before, the ambulance service is sending all available vehicles, perhaps a fixed-wing aircraft as well, to the Hunter region, where there are reports of several injuries. As reports trickled in, it was clear this was no ordinary earthquake. Fears of a massive explosion at the BHP steelworks proved unfounded. But with the power out, it was forced to vent its ovens to prevent a build-up of dangerous gases. A serious fire broke out at a nearby technical college when the force of the quake caused flammable chemicals to burst into flames. In the suburb of Hamilton, lives were feared lost under collapsed awnings and dozens of buildings were destroyed. The injured were brought here from as far away as Maitland, pushing hospital resources to the limit. We have no power, no services, can't operate there. There is major structural damage at Royal Newcastle Hospital. Staff evacuated intensive care patients and earthquake victims and set them up across the road on the beach. As the hours dragged on, hopes of finding survivors faded. Crews using sophisticated heat equipment scoured the ruins for signs of life. One by one, the bodies were brought out and still no one was sure how many were left behind. By nightfall, it was clear there were no more survivors. Rescue operations turned to salvage. Heavy machinery was brought in and the full extent of the club's destruction was revealed. One by one, the massive excavators lifted 10 flattened car bodies out of the hole. Originally parked on street level, the impact of the two-storey collapse had forced the cars down three metres to the basement. As the night wore on, rescuers located two more bodies, bringing the number of confirmed dead to nine. Back in Hamilton, where three people had been crushed to death by a falling awning, the exact moment of the earthquake had been frozen in time on the historical clock tower. I didn't know whether it was a bomb or what it was. All I knew, there was just bricks hailing through the roof. Prime Minister Bob Hawke offered his support. Together, we'll try and ensure that uh, all the assistance that is necessary uh, will be provided. And by now, news of the tragedy had made its way around the world. It was the first fatal earthquake ever in Australia. The quake registered 5.5 on the Richter scale. The epicenter of the quake, which measured 5.5 on the Richter scale, was just 18 kilometres west of Newcastle. The tremors, which lasted... The quake hit at mid-morning. 
flattening dozens of buildings. ...are still missing. The worst hit area, the city of Newcastle, about 75 miles north of Sydney. Eastern Australia is recovering from a big earthquake tonight. That quake hit 5.5 on the Richter scale, and it was centered near Newcastle, 80 miles to the north of Sydney. The final death toll for Australia's first deadly earthquake was 13. Nine in the Workers' Club, three in Hamilton, and one heart attack victim. It would take many years for Newcastle to recover. Australia is blessed with spectacular cliffs and towering rock formations. From the coast to the sheer escarpments of the Great Dividing Range. Dramatic, awe-inspiring, and potentially very dangerous. The cliff is there because it's formed by ongoing processes of the environment and geology. It's steep because it's continuing to fall. Rocks are falling off all the time. They just happen episodically. For a disaster to happen, then we need someone to be present when that episode of rockfall occurs. In 1996, the coastal village of Gracetown in Western Australia Students and teachers from the local primary school were watching an inter-school surfing competition when it started to rain. There they are, simply watching a surfing competition, sheltering from a rainstorm under cliffs that were always going to fall down at some time. Without warning, a 15-metre stretch of Huzzers Cliff collapsed. The crowd was buried under 30 tonnes of rock and sand. The teacher came up and said, you know, the cliff's gone. I knew that's a big cliff. And then someone yelled out that they could hear somebody and we flew across there. And... Within minutes, hundreds of locals were on the scene, armed with shovels, ropes, picks, anything they could lay their hands on. They pulled away boulders, dug desperately into the sand, clawed away with their hands. They moved mountains of dirt. They pulled rocks off cliffs that you'd never seen. And as day turned to night, they refused to give up their desperate mission. They broke ropes pulling, they just found strength from anywhere. You know, it was unbelievable. Families of victims watched and waited, hoping for good news that never came. One by one, the bodies were brought out. And then it happened. From under the rubble, rescuers heard a muffled cry. Against all odds, 10-year-old Sarah Otto had survived the rock fall. We dug a hole and I slipped my hand in there and this little girl grabbed hold of my hand. And it was just unbelievable. I just couldn't believe anybody would have been alive in such a situation. And, um, Especially as she wasn't the yeah. first one we got out. Been, we got yeah. three more out for her. Who weren't so lucky? No. Well, her mother was beside us, she said. She kept talking about she thought Mum was there and we could see the other body there. And um, she was a tremendously brave little girl. She said, don't let me go. And I said, there's no way I was going to let you go. It's just tragic. It is absolutely tragic. You know, I hope I never come across it again. It was just chaos. And uh, the, the one flicker of light was when we found this little girl. And I thought, hang on, you know, we may be able to find some more. But it wasn't to be. Despite everyone's efforts, Sarah was the only survivor from that terrible day. The final death toll was nine. Five adults, four children, a primary school teacher, a former town councillor, a local surf guru, a mother and son visiting from Melbourne, and Sarah Otto's mum. They were all part of a small, close-knit community that was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. The New South Wales resort town of Threadbow is nestled at the foot of Australia's highest mountain, Mount Kosciuszko. This is one of the most thrilling sports in the world, and Australia's alpine country offers some of the world's best skiing. Soon the chalets will be full. New roads in the snowy mountains have opened up new fields, so the rooftop of Australia looks forward to a boom season. At its peak, it attracts about 70,000 interstate and overseas skiers and snowboarders every year. But Threadbow is known for something other than great skiing. It's also famous as the home of a disaster 40 years in the making. In the 1940s, the massive hydroelectric scheme was being constructed through the Snowy Mountains. As part of the scheme, a road was built. 
The Alpine Way was never meant to be other than an access track, a simple four-wheel drive track. It was constructed by a bulldozer, pushing over the trees and then pushing the soil on top. And it was remained that way until the date of the disaster. There were stark warnings of what was to come. A section of the road simply disappeared in 1978. It happened again in 1992. The warnings were ignored. Should have seen it coming. The, the, the picture was written there in the rocks for everyone to see. A massive pile of soil dumped over the side in the construction of the road was lying on a steep slope. It was just sitting there waiting to fail. All we needed was another ingredient, the water. The leak started saturated a whole mass of soil in the old Alpine Way and on the edge of the car park, creating the first landslide. On the night of July 30th, 1997, the tight-knit community of Threadbow was ripped apart. It happened just before midnight with no warning. Hundreds of tons of rocks and earth avalanched from just beneath the Alpine Way, the main road, onto the Carinia Lodge. One person was sleeping there, but that building cannoned on down the hill, crushing the Bimba Dean Lodge. And 19 people, mostly resort staff, were there. All are now missing. A desperate search for 20 people after a landslide buries two ski lodges in the Snowy Mountains village of Threadbow. The longer it goes, obviously their chances are diminishing. The next morning, Australia woke to the news of devastation in one of its premier ski resorts. A section of ground below the busy Alpine Way Road had given way. Three and a half thousand tonnes of liquefied earth, rocks and rubble had flattened buildings, trees and cars. Tonnes of concrete slabs had collapsed on each other, trapping the lodge's occupants as they slept. There's no buildings there where there was buildings uh, when we went to bed. Police were on site within an hour, and by 2.30 a.m., more than 100 professionals had arrived. Rescuers like paramedic Paul Featherstone. It was between buildings, and it actually, everywhere else, looked brand new, you know, like it hadn't been touched, but just this devastation. Then on the right, people are actually skiing, still skiing down the slopes. For rescuers, this whole emergency has become so frustrating. It's now been eight hours and it's still considered far too dangerous for them to be allowed in to begin a search. We heard a lot of tragedy before that, the people that were here during that night, you know, horrendous situation for them uh, where they uh, heard people, but because the slope was so dangerous, you know, one of the hardest decisions to make was to pull those people back. Finally, nearly 11 hours after the landslide, the site was stabilised and rescuers swarmed over the rubble. There's roofing material that's uh, in a position that you wouldn't believe it would be halfway up a tree that's uh, stopped the movement of a large uh, boulder that's certainly causing us concern. Um, motor vehicles that were parked on uh, concrete slabs uh, are uh, in positions that uh, one couldn't believe that they would be in. Piece by painstaking piece, they carefully removed the bricks and crumbled concrete. One wrong move could trigger another slip, potentially sending rescuers to their deaths and ending the faint chance of finding survivors. So part of that was finding people, and if we found no deceased, the area was marked because we had to move on, hopefully, that we'd find someone alive. So those were sort of hard things for rescuers to have to do. Rescuers probed for signs of life with fibre optic poles and listening devices. Two hours into the operation, there was a brief ray of hope when noises were detected from somewhere inside the debris. You can hear me under there. Make some noise. But from beneath the rubble came only silence. And so the search went on. Tragic stories of the dreadful night began to emerge. Well, he was uh, walking on the road with, uh, with his wife and happened to be a few paces ahead of her. And uh, he, uh, he survived. Uh, at that stage, and, and, and she was gathered up in the, in the slippage as it came through. As the day turned to night, the operation dragged on in the numbing cold. Rescuers kept praying that under the next piece of rubble, they'd find some sign of life. Most Australians and Aussies are, are all heart, you know. Everyone wants to keep on going. 
Mate, I think everybody up there has this, you know, deep embedded thought that uh, there is a chance. As the rescue effort dragged into its second day, residents came together to support each other and try to make sense of the disaster. Bonded by grief, they flocked to the village church, just 500 metres from where their friends and colleagues were buried under the rubble. We pray for the whole community of Threadbow, who can't understand how such a thing could happen. By now, exhausted rescuers were battling fatigue, crippling cold and fading morale. Just three bodies had been located and there were still 17 people unaccounted for. We never predict that no one is alive until we've proven it. And it was sort of that night that we found Stuart. Stuart Diver and his wife Sally had been asleep in their room when their lodge collapsed, pinning them under slabs of concrete. Stuart was trapped in a small pocket surrounded by water with barely five centimetres of room above his face. Sally was not so lucky. Lying next to him, the level of the water had risen around her and she drowned. For 54 hours, Diver lay there, struggling to keep his nose above the rising and falling water, and then came the words he would never forget. There's a rescue party overhead, can you hear me? A miracle has occurred and signs of life were detected. Some muffled sounds from under the slab. Those few faint murmurs brought the tired rescuers to a silent and hopeful halt. A fireman's shout answered by a tired man's voice, ski instructor Stuart Diver was alive. I repeated the call and had a voice come strongly back to me. We all know the tragedy of it where he lost his wife. He, he heard a scream and he had a hold of his hand. It was to go through that and then be lying there for 60 hours thinking about nothing else and freezing cold and, and he was in like a little tomb. So initially we thought, you beauty, we only got to clean this mess out and we'll get someone out, you know? And then when we got there, we realised he wasn't there, that he was underneath. Now came the dangerous task of extricating him from under three massive concrete slabs. The job all of a sudden became tremendous, how we're going to get him out. Because these slabs on top were laid with other slabs, you know, like it was just going to be a mammoth effort. And was why a lot of heavy machinery wasn't used initially, because I thought if you miss something, something could slip, and if there was someone else alive, you might cut them in two. At great peril to the rescuers, they have tunnelled under that slab towards where the, the sounds were emanating from. They finally established visual contact via a 10 centimetre hole. When we cut the manhole, I could just squeeze my hand in the top of his chest. That's how tight he was laying in this freezing cold, black conditions for all those hours before he hurt anybody and then all those hours after he hurt us as well. For the next 11 hours, Paul held Stuart's hand and became a vital lifeline. We set up a casualty uh, treatment area with top physicians uh, right at the manhole entrance where we were going to drag him out because we had to pull him out vertically. And after he'd been horizontal with hypothermia for so long, that can be catastrophic. So we filled him up full of fluids and drugs and we got him as best as we could, pulled him up onto this treatment area and his vitals didn't change. And it was then the first time that we realised that we probably he will survive. At around 5pm, almost 12 hours after first contact, Stuart Diver was freed. When he first saw the light, the sky, he just looked at me and said, he said, that sky's fantastic. Cool. You can hear the cheering all the way up the valley now. Just a spontaneous outpouring. It's been a long time coming and uh, unbelievable when you consider what's happened here over the last three and a half days. To me, the roar of the crowd is just what it's all about. It's about human life and everyone pitching in. You know, it wasn't just me, it was thousands of people pitching in to get this one man out of that situation. Stuart was flown to nearby Canberra Hospital where he was given a hero's welcome. <laughs> Amazingly, he'd suffered only minor lacerations and some frostbite. I'd just like to uh, thank uh, everyone who was involved in my rescue, um, the fire brigade, uh, and all the rescue services, along with the medical teams uh, at Threadbow and uh, here in Canberra, and uh, to all the people who have prayed uh, 
for me and uh, given me so much support over the last couple of days. Um, it's been overwhelming and I don't think I would have uh, made it through without the involvement of all those people. It's been fantastic and uh, thanks very much. Meanwhile, the rescue operations continued. Stuart Diver's one in a million survival gave them new hope, but as the hours turned into days, it was clear there would be no more miracles. It was one week later when rescuers recovered the last body, bringing the final death toll to 18. One of the most bizarre examples of shifting Earth is the formation of sinkholes. They can be big, they can be small, and they can occur in the strangest places. Queensland's Linda Ray Mackay awoke one day to a shocking change to the backyard of her Ipswich home. The sinkhole was first spotted by a neighbour at around 9am. I heard a bang and a splush. When I looked over the fence, I had about a six foot round hole. And in a few hours, it went from curiosity to a potential threat. Really would like some people out of here. Thank you. Come on. What started as a mystery turned out to be a 113-year-old relic of the region's coal mining past. What we believe is that this is uh, an exploration shaft. It would have been a two metre by two metre square um, vertical excavation, probably about 100 metres deep. Authorities were concerned about their house, but 24 hours later, the hole had been filled which left the Mackays jumping with joy. Sinkholes are not uncommon. The underlying cause is usually erosion brought on by flowing water. In some cases, underground cavities collapse, weakening the ground above them. Queensland's Stradbroke Island has long been a favourite retreat for holidaymakers. In 2017, campers found one of their favourite spots disappearing before their eyes. Jason Pierce and his three daughters were on the sand when it all began to shift. And you could feel the um, vibrations through the uh, ground when the rocks hit the bottom of the sea. We kind of jumped back really quickly and then we're just like, whoa. <laughs> the normally popular Amity Point was proving to be anything but friendly. A chunk of beach the size of an Olympic swimming pool had vanished. Big difference, just amazing. Fortunately, nothing was lost. Two years earlier, just near Rainbow Beach, Inskip Point overnight went from this to this. 23 kilometres of pristine coastline bisected, leaving a sinkhole 100 metres wide and at least 10 metres deep. The water devoured caravans and camping equipment, trapping it in the sludge. Dash cam from a camper's car shows two men's frantic efforts to save their caravan. Beaches like this are created by sand drifting on prevailing currents. If the sand base becomes unstable, it's undermined by the water and eventually collapses, taking bites out of the Australian coastline. Moulded by wind and waves, beaches are often backed by a buffer of sand dunes to protect against damage from storms, as well as providing a reservoir of sand to replenish and maintain the beach at times of erosion. But the sand dunes themselves are now under attack from the activities of man. From encroaching development to four-wheel driving and increased foot traffic, the threat has become a major environmental issue. Increased coastal degradation and the destabilising of a highly sensitive ecosystem risks leaving our coast at the mercy of the elements. It's this inherent instability of the sandy shoreline that can trap the unwary, especially children. Over the years, the lure of these seemingly harmless beach playgrounds has resulted in many tragedies. Records show there were 31 recreational sandhole deaths since 1985 in the United States, United Kingdom, Australia and New Zealand. And there were 21 incidents where a person was rescued from a collapse, in several cases by bystanders who performed CPR. The victims, mostly boys, ranged in age from 3 to 21 years, with the average age about 12. 
In fact, statistics show sand is more dangerous than sharks. Just seconds from death, 11-year-old Nathan Good was buried alive. I was just shocked. Scared. I was screaming and everything. It was really scary. Nathan and two friends were taking a shortcut across the dunes at Cudgeon Beach in Queensland. They started digging, like, really hard and frantically Sand. to um, pull me out, and I just, like, got out because I was, like, in a ball with, like, like, that much of space to breathe, so it was running out really fast. Paramedics and police took over. The sandbank was actually continually falling in on top of him, so we had to make some uh, makeshift barricades with our spine boards out of our vehicles uh, and then dig the sand out from around underneath him. Lucky Nathan emerged with only scratched knees and has learned a valuable lesson. Don't play in sand dunes. At Markula Beach, 10-year-old Bryce and his 9-year-old mate Michael were digging tunnels in the side of a small dune when the sand gave way. And I saw it fall down on me, so I had to turn my face so I could breathe. It was just blackness at me. Only their legs were left protruding from the sand. I was saying to myself that I'm going to make it, and I thought I was going to die at starting. Bryce kept breathing in an air pocket. His mate wasn't so lucky. It was really scary for me because um, I fainted from the air. I couldn't breathe. No one's sure how long it was before passers-by came to save them, but paramedics say it was just in time. Well, I think it was any longer. I think it would have been a real tragedy. The boys were keen to meet their saviours. Are you the one who saved us? Yes, all of us. All of us. <laughs> and the father was grateful beyond words. Hey, my lord. I know these guys, I really do. I, I just, you know, I want to I know these guys for the rest of my life. Well, that's good to know, and uh, I hope it's going to be useful for somebody else. There are two main types of erosion. Both pose dangers to the Australian coastline. It's a slow onset coastal erosion is really a, a process which takes place over geological timescales, so centuries to thousands of years. And what, what we're looking at there is waves in general, day-to-day -day waves, day-to-day -day tides, slowly eroding and reshaping our rocky coasts. A great example of a rocky coast which is eroding through slow onset erosion is the Victorian coastline and the Twelve Apostles. I think there are now only eight left uh, and they're collapsing over a human time scale so we need to be aware of this. They're a great tourist attraction of course, but in time, over, over geological time probably there'll be none left. The most alarming form of coastal erosion is rapid onset, when huge chunks of coastal areas are destroyed by massive seas and storm surges. This is Collaroy and Narrabeen on Sydney's northern beaches. In 1946, six shacks collapsed and a house floated out to sea. It had been identified as a coastal erosion risk as far back as the 1920s. But the warnings have time and time again gone unheeded. In 1967, the homes and apartment blocks along the beachfront were threatened with collapse as their very foundations were exposed. The landmark Flight Deck apartment building had its pilings exposed by a storm one year after it was built. The building was saved by dumping thousands of tonnes of fill and sand to construct a seawall. A few beaches south, workmen and residents battled to save a large section of the famous Manly Beach, which was threatened by monstrous seas. More than 60 feet of seawall toppled into the ocean. Racing against time and the heavy rain, machine operators constructed a temporary rock wall before the tide rose. Debates about the effectiveness of sea and rock walls have spanned decades. Sea walls work in certain situations to provide the foundation for the coastal roads and then the houses behind to maintain the beach profile and beach width. So in certain situations, sea walls are a great solution, but in others, it can actually exacerbate the situation and lead to the loss of the beach. 
In 1974, more misery as an even bigger event hit Sydney's northern beaches. Huge seas attacked much of the east coast. All along the coastline, the forces of nature have taken their toll, and it's been a heavy one at that. Mile after mile of beachfront is just eroded by the constant pounding of the heavy seas. Amazingly, more high-rises had been built since the last wave of destruction, and predictably, their foundations were undermined once again. Valiant attempts were made to shore up the seawall, a temporary fix until the next inevitable attack from the seas. North of Sydney, Womberall was also being hit that year. When the cottage tumbled into the sea this morning, it marked the end of a three-day battle to try and save it. Huge steel girders had been placed under it during the weekend, and today the owners were intending moving it back from the cliff edge but the heavy seas and unusually high tides beat them. The house went soon after eight o'clock this morning. First it was the front veranda, then room after room followed it down the hill. And at the same time, the filling, a quarter of the filling underneath that second house gave way. And with another huge tide expected tonight, the locals here say there's no chance of saving it. At eight o'clock, the last little bit of sand just went in front of the pier here and, and away it went. And it went mighty quick. Meanwhile, Queensland didn't escape the drama as four cyclones and two massive storms battered the Gold Coast, smashing the foreshore and destroying the Holiday Haven's waterfront homes. Ignoring the warning signs, this infamous stretch of coastline has now exploded in beachfront development. In 2016, waves of up to eight metres hit Sydney destroying several homes in Collaroy and washing gardens and swimming pools into the ocean as a huge low pressure system combined with king tides to cause widespread destruction. Metres of coastal land were sliced away and several million dollar homes hung precariously on the edge of sand cliffs. This is what the beach looked like before and after. The southern suburbs of Sydney didn't escape, as this couple found out. Trying to mop up as the king tide built was proving to be a useless exercise. <coughs> Cafes were engulfed, seafronts washed away, and surf clubs badly damaged. With over 6% of the country living within three kilometres of the coastline and sea levels rising, this problem is only going to get worse. Scientists predict sea levels could rise by up to 40 centimetres by 2050 and 90 centimetres by 2100. To put that in perspective, a report predicts that a sea level rise of just 20 centimetres in Narrabeen, combined with a one in 50 year storm surge, would see the ocean push the coastline back 110 metres. Other hotspots are Lake's entrance in Victoria and Queensland's Sunshine Coast. The horrifying prediction is that $226 billion in property and infrastructure around Australian coasts are potentially at risk by 2100. We all value the coast really highly. Problem is, in Australia, we're built right to the edge. Coasts change, and they're not static environments, and we need to understand and, and, and incorporate that into our thinking. But to this day, houses continue to be built in these danger zones, ignoring the last 100 years of history. The coast of the future has the real potential for being a different landscape that we're familiar with. And with sea level rise, global warming, that there's the real risk that storm surges will reach higher and further inland. The interior of the driest continent in the world can be a forbidding place, intensely hot and covered in iconic red dust. It's an environment rarely visited by coastal communities, but sometimes the inland comes to them. In 1939, New South Wales experienced grainy skies and roads choked by powder-fine dust that took months to clean up. Another storm hit Melbourne in 1983, engulfing the entire city in a matter of minutes. 
Sydney's also copped its fair share of dust storms. 15 years ago, this brownout caused havoc in the CBD. But that was nothing compared to what Sydney woke up to on September 23, 2009, the day that dawned red. A one in 70 year dust storm formed many kilometres away, settled over the city, turning the iconic sites into apocalyptic visions and transforming the everyday morning commute into an unforgettable experience. The massive rusty cloud had swept across half the country, propelled by an intense cold front that first struck South Australia. So in an extended drought period where you've got exposed surface, that is there's little grass because it hasn't grown, means that you've got the ability for the soil to be available for when you have a big wind event to pick it up and, and have that mobile in the air. Relentlessly, the storm turned eastward into New South Wales, hanging like a blanket across a giant sweep of eastern Australia, eventually affecting three states. The mining town of Broken Hill, right in its path, saw an eerily beautiful but daunting sight. There's a lot of soil in that air, man. This family's home was swamped by the surreal storm in a few seconds. This has got black up. Oh my gosh. I think we better go outside, Ted. Yeah. Oh, that is horrible. It's just gone completely black. I can't even see anything on the camera. Oh my gosh. That is like dark time. Over 10 years of drought, so the environment's dry, you get a windy, dry day, uh, picks up the, the, the dust and it puts it, no, like, completely lost visibility in dust. It went on to savage farmland, the precious topsoil blown out to sea and flattening crops knock the flour off the canola and lay the wheat down as well. One more blow for the region in the grip of a terrible drought. There's quite a potential desperate situation developing out there. The dust front moved quickly, hitting Canberra and crossing the Great Dividing Range. That's just the freakiest thing ever. Strong winds saw it engulf Sydney overnight. It's several hundred kilometres long and probably something like 150 kilometres wide, so very, very extensive. Transport ground to a halt, Sydney's ferries sitting in an empty sea of red. Commuters have been stranded many times before, but never for anything like this. With an 1,100 tonne vessel, we need to see what's in front of us. While to the north, Lismore was hit by lunchtime. Soon after, Brisbane was in a haze. By nightfall, the dust was slowly settling, leaving a huge cleanup in its wake. Just like a dust storm, the Earth has a habit of rising up against us when we least expect it. Despite measures like maintaining safe infrastructure and enforcing tough building codes, we're largely powerless in the face of these events. In the end, survival can come down to the skill and patience of our rescuers. The human value of what happens in these disasters is what it's about. It affects so many people at the end of the day. And having the right resources to make sure that if something happens to a human being, we're doing the best we can to get them home.